Hey everyone, it's Tony with Hidden Light Photography, and tonight is a super exciting night because as you can see behind me, the Carbon Star 200 is on the mount and ready for first light. So if you enjoy this video, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. I don't want you to miss out on any upcoming exciting content. Now let's jump on in and get first light with the Carbon Star 200. <music> Now, before we jump in the first light, I did promise everyone an honest review, and there are a couple of things that I wanna point out. First of all, this Carbon Star 200 is an absolute gem of a telescope. It is gorgeous and it is very well built, but there are a couple of little things that I wanna point out that I noticed, and the first thing is gonna be, I wish that Apertura included longer dovetails. The problem right now is with the shorter dovetails, that means that the guide scope is further forward than what I would like it to be. Not necessarily an issue, but being that the Carbon Star 200 is built for larger sensor cameras, those setups can get heavy fast, especially when you're using a rotator, a filter wheel, and a heavier camera like the ASI 2600. And being that the imaging setup is at the front, this scope gets nose heavy very quick. So having longer dovetails means that I can push the guider further backwards, thus counterbalancing the extra weight in the front. Being that the scope or the guide scope is further forward, that means I have to physically move the scope backwards. And what that does is it causes clearance issues with my filter wheel to the mount. So having longer dovetails, moving the, the guide scope further back, I can move the scope physically forward, thus giving myself more clearance between the filter wheel and the, the mount. The next thing is the uh, dust plate, it's pretty loose fitting on the scope, so it falls out very easily. So if you're maneuvering the scope quite a bit, you want to be very careful because that dust plate can fall off. And I want to make sure that if you're moving it, you have it secured so it doesn't fall and potentially crack. Otherwise, with the lightweight nature of this scope, it balances beautifully. Aside from what I just described with declination, um, with the shorter dovetails, declination still balanced, but we have that clearance issue. But on right ascension, I can actually use less counterweight than what I do with my 200P. When I'm balancing my 200P on this mount, I actually use one of the counterweights from my AVX mount. With the lightweight nature of this scope, I don't need that other counterweight from the AVX mount. I can use just the two counterweights that come with the EQ6R Pro and I get really good balance. So I'm really excited to see how this does with guiding and how being a lighter setup affects guiding. Other than that, as you can see, it's getting dark. Let's get started. The feeling of first light never gets old. But the big question is, how did the Carbon Star 200 actually perform? One of the easier things to identify is how stable was focus? And did the carbon fiber body actually help with reducing autofocus runs? Here's the autofocus record from the two nights I imaged. Starting August 2nd at 9.03, we have an autofocus run for luminance. Since I was in my Nina profile for the 200P, I ran autofocus really quick to make sure that the parameters would work with the Carbon Star 200's focuser. And as we can see, 
it worked pretty well. The next item at 907 was me running autofocus on the hydrogen alpha filter so I can run flat frames. From there at 922, I ran autofocus on oxygen three again so I can capture flat frames. At 942, this is when I started the sequence. So in my sequence, I slew in center, I start guiding, and then I run autofocus. And that's what we see right here. At 1220, we did get our first autofocus run. This would have been triggered by HFR. So we have one autofocus that was triggered. And then shortly after that, at 1249, we flipped Meridian. So this autofocus run was just triggered by Meridian flip. From there, at 202 AM, we switched over to the Oxygen 3 filter, and then the sequence went and ran autofocus due to the filter change. And at that point, we started imaging the next night. Here we started with oxygen three, and this was to run flat frames, and that was 956. At 1010, I switched to the sulfur two filter, ran autofocus so I can capture flat frames with that filter. At 1030, we have the sequence start. We started with oxygen three that night, and then after slewing and centering, start guiding, we run autofocus. At 1135, we do have an autofocus run. This would have been triggered by HFR, and that was on the oxygen three filter. And at 1204 AM, we switch over to the sulfur two filter so this autofocus run was triggered by a filter change. And then finally at 1244, this would have been triggered by a meridian flip. Now comparing this to my 200P, this is roughly two to three on average less autofocus runs due to HFR. So with that said, the carbon fiber body is definitely helping out. And when our time under the stars is so limited, every minute counts. When it comes to image quality, I'm actually pretty blown away. The 200P did a good job, but this scope is on a whole new level. Here's some of the hydrogen alpha subframes. And let's go ahead and zoom into one of the edges here. Let's go ahead and find some brighter stars. Looks like we have some right here. Now, it's not perfect, but this is a lot better than what the 200P performs. Even with the Quattro Coma Corrector that Skywatcher sells for that particular scope. Now this Carbon Star 200 does have the Apertura recommended coma corrector and it's the one that comes as a package deal with the scope. But as we go through these subframes here, again it's not perfect but this is a lot better than what the 200P has shown. In fact there's some areas where the stars are actually in really good shape. We'll go ahead and check the other side. Let's go ahead and find some brighter stars here. And you can see, you know, we have some elongation. These couple of frames are gonna be tracking issues with the mount, it's understandable. But for the most part, these stars are intact. They're nice and round, especially at the edges of a large mirror. The brighter star doesn't look too bad. I mean, I think that this really did a very, very good job with capturing data. 
Now let's go ahead and let's open up where the NGC 7000 folder, Hydrogen Alpha Master, and let's exit out of Blink really quick. And let's do a quick stretch here. Here is the stacked image. Again, let's head on into the edge. Again, the stars not looking horrible. This is pretty good. Go off to the side. You know, we have some elongation on this side over here. But again, this is much, much better than what my 200P did. Now, one thing that really just impressed me with this, let's go ahead into process, all processes. Let's grab dynamic crop. Let's execute that. Go into script, steady astro, automatic DBE. Let's go ahead and draw an exclusion area around our bright star here and execute. Let's check our background model, looking good. The contrast is absolutely stunning. In fact, I can honestly say the data that this scope captured was so much easier to work with in post-processing than the data that I got off of my 200P. Even the colors just popped so much more. I feel like the data that I get from the 200P, I'm kind of fighting. Uh, maybe fighting is a strong word. I, I feel like I have to work for it. Whereas the data coming off of this Carbon Star 200 just falls into place. It is easy to work with. And I don't feel like I need to adjust saturation. Um, just such a slight adjustment in saturation just for screen aesthetics for the video. And even that may have been too much. I probably should have just left the saturation the way it was. It's just incredible the difference that we had. But it's not always all about the good things. Next, let's go into some of the things that I liked and also some of the things I did not like about the scope. Again, I want to make sure I do an honest review, and there are a few things that I want to point out that I didn't really necessarily like about the scope. Let's start with the bad. After handling the scope and finally using it, it is a bit hard to find things I don't like about it. But there are a couple that jump right out, and with a bit of critiquing, I think I have a fair list. We already discussed the need for longer dovetail bars if you're using a heavier imaging train. This isn't a deal breaker though, and very easily addressed. We also already spoke about the loose dust cover. Again, not a deal breaker. Just install some tape or another means to tighten the fit. Not a big deal at all. Part of my cable management is routing my harness between the lower dovetail and the OTA. I wish they gave a little bit more space between those two as my harness doesn't really fit. That's okay though, this is a very rare problem that most people will probably never encounter. The same goes for the upper dovetail. Having it there is tempting to use it as a handle, and generally that'll work, but they don't leave much room, so it makes it a bit awkward picking the scope up. I'm used to wrapping my hand between the lower dovetail and the OTA to lift or move, so the tighter area on both the upper and lower dovetail make it a bit hard to get my hands where I need them, but it just takes getting used to at this point, and the scope is deceivingly light, so even though it's not what I'm used to, the light weight makes it easy to deal with. Now, on to the good. The aesthetics and build quality are there. So far, I'm seeing fewer autofocus runs triggered by the scope losing focus. The lighter weight can improve guiding, but this is a hard one to judge. 
There are so many variables that go along with guiding and most of the guiding capability is up to the mount itself. However, with that said, the more weight you pack onto a mount, the harder it is to guide. I did see improved guiding the last couple of nights and if I were to put a number on it, my average guiding with the 200P is about 0.6 to 0.7 the carbon star over the last couple of nights was about 0.4 to 0.5. Please keep in mind that this is not enough data to judge if the improvement was due to conditions or the weight difference. The focuser is solid. I saw more consistent HFR between autofocus runs than I did on the 200P. Also, the way the thumb screws feel when locking your imaging train into place is a true quality feel. I don't feel the temptation to over tighten the thumb screws as they feel solid when tightening. I also almost feel as if they're a bit lower, giving more space between the imaging train and the thumb screws, making them easier to reach and handle. The image quality produced is very high and the data so far has been easier to post-process and get a cleaner, higher quality final image. If you're looking at this scope to upgrade, I highly recommend it. If you're brand new looking for your first scope, I also recommend this scope. And now, let's check out what this scope produced. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did and want to help support the channel, check out that join button and consider joining a Hidden Light Photography membership. There's lots of perks in it for you, and your support helps me bring you more content. Another way you can help support the channel is checking out my High Point Scientific Affiliate link if you're in the market for some new gear. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and the support helps me keep the channel growing. Also, do me a favor, that channel icon that popped up? hit that channel icon and subscribe. I don't want you to miss out on any future content. Drop a comment in the comment section. Are you looking for your first scope or trying to upgrade? What are your thoughts on the Carbon Star 200 and what you saw about it in this video? And then check out that next video. Until the next time, clear skies.